Okay, oh, before I start, a schedule reminder. Uh, next week is uh, spring break week for Cal State. You guys don't get the week off, but <laughs> I do. <laughs> I decided to take the break and make you go to school. <laughs> or Ed did, anyway. I'll blame him. Uh, so anyways, next week uh, there is no class, is my point. We're off for spring break. And again, for those remote schools that are off next week, that'd be fine. If you're off a different week, which many are, then you can watch the class on tape and catch up after your week off. So it all works out in the end. So the next class will be uh, two weeks from today, uh, Tuesday, and we'll continue on. Okay, now, uh, page 179. Last week we started our arrhythmias and then hypertension. So what I'll do is what I always do, and that is we'll backtrack a little bit and just review where we came from from last class. And so uh, we started out talking about arrhythmias. And again, arrhythmias are uh, more or less the same frequency as they are outside of the OR. Um, some textbooks will say they're more common under anesthesia, some people say less. Uh, I t tend to think it's about the same as it is in the regular population or a little less. Just because, as I mentioned last week, when you give cardiac depressants, they do tend to be antiarrhythmic. And not specifically for arrhythmia, but it's just a general sense. Uh, but arrhythmias aren't a major issue. Under anesthesia, I'm sure you've been in anesthesia long enough where you know see uh, arrhythmias stopping surgery or uh, causing problems very much. Uh, they can occasionally, and it's no different than outside the OR. Uh, the only difference is, of course, that you treating the arrhythmia in the middle of a surgery, as I said last week, uh, three lead EKG with all of our drugs superimposed on whatever you decide to give. So it's a little different in that sense, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the therapy is going to be the same as the ACLS protocols, etc. Antiarrhythmic drugs are the same no matter what. And uh, so we start on page 179. We no I noted that the, the classified in the United States into four classes and other outside the U.S. it's, it's class five classes. Uh, so class one are drugs that block sodium channels, class two are uh, beta blockers, uh, class three are potassium channel blockers, they prolong repolarization, and class four are the calcium channel blockers. Class five is other, including adenosine, ditch, atropine, etc. <clears throat> uh, so that's how they're classified. And then we went through and talked a little bit about their mechanisms and so on. Uh, if you jump to page 183, uh, the uh, recent literature says that probably the most common, well, other than PVCs, which are relatively harmless uh, in small numbers, um, the most common named arrhythmia that you can see under anesthesia is probably atrial fib. And so they talk here, and the, it was under conclusion on page 183. If you have a patient with atrial fib, uh, ventricular rate control is widely used as first line therapy. So as long as their rate isn't too fast and they're not having too many breakthrough arrhythmias, uh, they're going to be fine for chronic atrial fib. Lenient rate control, which means the heart rate is less than 110. Maybe a reasonable alternative to strict control, but people who do that believe the heart rate should be below 80. I think most anesthesia folks would be satisfied with 110 until you get the patient off the table. A beta blocker for apomelodotizam is generally used for long term rate control and short term. A beta blocker is preferred for patients with coronary disease or systolic dysfunction. And verapamil or tizen are preferred over beta blockers in people with COPD or asthma for the obvious reason 
that beta blockers are constrict. And the odorone may be effective when other drugs have failed. Antiarrhythmic drugs, particularly in odorone, can be used to restore and maintain normal function. Treatment of choice for urgent conversion of atrial fib is DC cardioversion. A radiofrequency catheter ablation of cardiac tissue responsible for triggering and maintaining the arrhythmia can also restore function. Those are obviously outside the OR, not surgical treatments. So in surgery, you just want to get the rate down, blood pressure stabilized, until you can get the patient and read back you. Um, page 184, we talked a little bit about adenosine, only in the sense that I was trying to point out. Adenosine works on what are called purine receptors, and um, are able to uh, stop SA and AV nodal uh, conduction. And uh, jumping up to page, well, 189, it's called page 51 in my book, unfortunately. 189, Drugs for Cardiac Arrhythmias, Treatment Guidelines, and we just summarized by saying this. You go to the next page, 190. Atrial fib, anything atrial. The treatment would be a calcium channel blocker for apomelodotizin and always start with a lower dose than you would outside the OR. Um, for uh, alternative, you can use a beta blocker <coughs> if it's more appropriate at that time. For other SVTs, the treatment is the same. Since we can't give adenosine in the surgery, you're going to use a calcium blocker. For ventricular, anything with ventricular in it, it'd be amiodarone. For bradycardia, it's atropine. For a severe tachycardia, it's esmolol, which we're going to cover today. And uh, for trosads, it's magnesium. So those are the treatments of choice for the various arrhythmias. And um, Page 146 is dosing, so there's some doses listed for your visual pro uh, pleasure and looking at, and that's it. And we went on to hypertension, and going to page 198, the new, as in the last two months, uh, definitions are listed on the bottom of the table on page 198. I'm going to ask you this on the test. You got to learn it. what is hypertension. It's pretty basic stuff. And here it is. Normal, I'm about to page 198. Normal blood pressure is anything less than 120 over 80. Uh, slightly elevated or elevated blood pressure is systolic of 120 to 129 or a diastolic of 80 to 89. Uh, stage 1 hypertension is a systolic. 130 to 139, and a diastolic 80 to 89. And stage two is systolic greater than 140, and diastolic greater than 90. And generally, a hypertensive crisis that's not on this table is considered a blood pressure above 180, systolic 120, diastolic. So above 180 over 120. It's at least a hypertensive urgency, if not emergency. And for us, we would do something to immediately get it lower. And it's not uncommon to hit, hit the pancreas with a patient, especially a hypertensive patient. And the initial blood pressure and a few first blood pressures when you first get them in and get it starting to get the patient settled, it's not surprising to see 200 over 130 or some elevated pressure, 190 over 120 or something. And usually uh, you can get the pressure down by giving some analgesics, make sure they're not in pain, put a nice warm blanket on, elevate the head of the bed if they're so amenable to that. Surgery doesn't preclude you raising the head of the bed a little bit. 
uh, keep the patient warm, make them pain free, um, uh, that kind of thing. A lot of times we'll get the pressure to settle down. If not, you can treat it with drugs, which we'll talk about today. So that's the definition of blood pressure. And then we went on to talk about the various uh, successes, and that was on over the years for recognition and treatment. That was on page 204. And I could summarize this whole point by saying this. We're a little better at recognizing people with hypertension. We check blood pressures a lot of times. Or in the past we didn't. So the recognition is in the high 60s, low 70s now for most studies. So about 70% of the patients now have been told or realized they have at least some degree of hypertension. Uh, the controlling or success of treating it is still you know, mediocre, I would say. And it's in the 50s to low 60s range. And uh, so you're going to have a lot of hypertensive patients that come to surgery that are not well controlled. And then lastly, we went to uh, the drugs for hypertension, and that was listed. And I have the page marked here. And this is kind of where we left off. We started to go through the various classes. So as of 2018, this is the way it works. There's four classes, although most books list five, but the current recommendation is four, but nobody pays attention to it and they say five. So they recommend either a calcium channel blocker, a ACE inhibitor, an angiotensin receptor blocker, ARB, a diuretic, those are the big four, and many physicians still use beta blockers as, as treatment. Although the committee now recommends beta blocker not as a first line treatment, but as an alternative. Or if the patient has other diseases that can be benefited by putting them on a beta blocker, then you can use it for that. So, the big four are diuretics, calcium blockers, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs. And we'll add beta blockers as a fifth category. Uh, we went through this a little bit, and the uh, uh, diuretics, first of all, the uh, mechanism of action is not real clear. Uh, you get an initial drop in blood volume or contraction of blood volume, but then after a short period of time, that rebounds and goes back to normal. So the diuretic effect kind of goes away of the low-dose oral diuretic. Uh, but at the same time, the blood pressure stays down. Uh, many people speculate the mechanism is opening potassium channels in blood vessels and vasodilating. But that's just speculation. Uh, so diuretics are, are highly recommended as first-line therapy because they're safe, they have minimal side effects, they've been around forever, and we know mostly all about them, and they're very inexpensive. You can usually put somebody on a diuretic for less than, oh, 10 or 20 bucks a month. Well, the second treatment is uh, the... Uh, ACE inhibitors, and we went through on page 211 how they work. So let me review that, and I'm going to go on the camera and point. And I got a little
Yeah, here we are. Page 211, and we mentioned the mechanism is uh, as follows. Um, angiotensinogen is a precursor derived from the liver. It is acted upon by renin, and renin converts it into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 then is converted into angiotensin 2 by the converting enzyme, ACE. And angiotensin 2 acts on, this is kind of a weirdo, so follow me, I'm not making a mistake. Angiotensin 2 acts on angiotensin 1 receptors. So angiotensin receptors, as you can see on the bottom here, there's a green one, a yellow one, and a purple one, just for show. And the angiotensin 1 receptor is the primary one. That's where mostly angiotensin 2 acts. A little bit at the other ones. Uh, angiotensin 1 also affects aldosterone receptors and affects sodium reabsorption or sodium load. And that's how the how angiotensin works. It's a complementary system to the catecholamines and helps sustain blood pressure. The downside of ACE inhibitors, here's ACE inhibitors here, they block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. The downside is they also block the breakdown of bradykinin. That's shown here. And if you block the breakdown or allow the accumulation of bradykinin, the patients get a cough, and it's tr troublesome into the point where some of the literature says up to 20% of the patients that are given an ACE inhibitor have to be switched over to an ARB because they get persistent cough. Now, the ARBs are here, the little green blob, and the angiotensin receptor blocker merely just comes, blocks the receptor, it's a classic antagonist drug and produces blockade. It doesn't mess with any of the other mechanisms and therefore has less side effects. Now a third drug, aliskarin, is a direct renin inhibitor. That's the little green thing here. And they're showing it blocking the uh, release of renin and uh, therefore you can't start the first step. So there is one drug that's called a direct renin inhibitor that nobody uses because it costs too much, but it nonetheless it's on the market. So there's three drugs, summarized, that can affect the angiotensin receptor system. ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and direct renin inhibitor. There we go. So we did this last week, and uh, of course the ACE inhibitors, uh, that's their mechanism, the ARBs, that's their mechanism, okay? The uh, next, on the uh, page 219, were the calcium channel blockers, and uh, they, of course, have been used for many, many decades is antihypertensive agents. There's a bunch of different ones. We don't have to worry about the subclassifications. But they mostly produce their antihypertensive effect by depressing the heart directly and by vasodilating. Now we can just go out, let me go off on a tangent here for a second. Um, it's pretty easy to think the calcium channel blockers. If you have a muscle, heart muscle, vascular fluid muscle, blood vessel, whatever, and you make the calcium in that muscle lower, the muscle's going to relax. Calcium contracts muscles. Less calcium, less contraction. Simple physiology, right? So if you give a calcium channel blocker and block the amount of calcium in the muscle, in the heart muscle, that would be cardiac depression. And a blood vessel will mean relaxation and vasodilation. And that's how they work. By blocking calcium. That's pretty simple. 
Anytime a muscle contracts stronger or harder, somewhere along the line, calcium had to go up in the muscle. When it contracts less hard or is depressed, calcium had to go down. That's a, the eventual physiology of it all. Okay, that's calcium channel blockers. And then lastly are the beta blockers. And uh, the base of the beta blockers are good for hypertension. Uh, they don't work as well as some of the other drugs, so that you would prefer they're not used as first line treatment. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, they're commonly used. Um, and with this little uh, note on the beta blockers, they don't, this isn't in your literature, but I have it separately. Uh, when you initiate beta blockade, BP changes a little at first because of compensatory increase in peripheral resistance. However, over time, the blood pressure falls. The antihypertensive effect of beta blockers occurs because of one, blocking beta receptors in the heart causes myocardial depression. Two, blocking Running receptors in the kidneys, renin release is a beta-1 effect. Therefore, beta blockers prevent renin release. That's an antihypertensive. That's number two. So, in other words, how do the beta blockers make your blood pressure go down? Number one, they're cardiac depressant. Number two, they block renin release. And number three, they're CNS depressant, cardiovascular center in the brain. So they have three mechanisms. Now, let me stop and talk for about the beta blockers for just a minute. Um, way back when, when I was a baby, um, and beta blockers were around initially in the 70s, became pretty widely prescribed. When patients came to surgery, we were afraid to put those patients to sleep because they were on a cardiac depressant. So the common wisdom at that time, it's stupid, but this is what we thought, it was, well, they're on a cardiac depressant, and if I give them propofol or at that time it was pentothal, I'll make their blood pressure go down, way down during induction. So we better discontinue the beta blockers prior to surgery. So we did. And that was the common wisdom. Take the patient off beta blockers. Well, the patients are all having arrhythmias and hypertension and all kinds of problems. But you took them off their medicine. And it was like shocking. Oh my God, how do they get their high blood pressure? Well, you took them off their blood pressure medicine. How do you think it went up? So anyways we finally realized that it was dumb. And it was especially dumb because when you're put on a beta blocker, you upregulate. So they made more beta receptors to try to compensate. And once you unload or take the drug off of those receptors, the patient has extra receptors around. They have a rebound hypertension, rebound arrhythmias, rebound angina, whatever they're on the beta blocker for. So the patients had a lot of problems. So we realized not only do you not want to discontinue beta blockers, you want to make sure they're continued all the way through surgery so the patient isn't upregulated and then doesn't have any drug on board. So then we get, thought, went for a little time, that uh, all patients should be on beta blockers because we like slow heart rates, light and low blood pressure. So then we went the opposite extreme. We did a 180 and said, let's put everybody on beta blockers. It'll be so much better for surgery. When I see my heart rate going 50 all the way across for the whole case, I look like a genius. The patient was calm, analgesic, what a nice case. So they put everybody on beta blockers, and of course that didn't work out either. And uh, um, there was some discussion over which patients should be put on or not. And um, I have a little write-up. This is from um, uh, Dr. Brunwald's book. Uh, Bernwald is the uh, Bible of cardiology. Uh, Eugene Bernwald is from Harvard, and he's written about 90 editions. 
He's uh, about 140 years old right now. His picture's still on the cover of his book, though. And he just put out a new edition about two weeks ago. And he, this is what he notes from the beta blockers. And I want to point out, there's a physician named Dr. Polderman, P-O-L-D-E-R-M-A-N. He's from the Netherlands. And he published, I would say, at least 50 studies in various cardiac journals promoting the use of beta blockers. How should we give them? When should we put the patient on them? Oh, how wonderfully they all do being on beta blockers and so on. And then they found out he made it all up. <laughs> he just made up all the data. He, he'd never studied anything he said he studied. And about 50 papers had to be retracted from every major cardiology journal. It was a tremendous research scandal. And it's still kind of, it's over now and it's been 10 years. But they're still mopping up the disaster left over from his uh, uh, troubles. So this is what Dr. Burnwall says. Beta blockers have undergone extensive study in perioperative risk management. Some of the trial data used to support recommendations on titrated use of beta blockers has become uncertain. Now, isn't that a nice way to say it? He lied. A recent meta-analysis of all the beta blocker trials demonstrates that beta blockers decrease non-fatal MIs, but they increase strokes and death from surgery. So they're kind of mixed bag. They'll make less MIs, they have an increase overall mortality. Nowadays, the common wisdom is this. Beta blockers should be used on a case by, I can put this on there. Why don't I do that? Beta blockers can be put on, on a case by case basis and Here's the current recommendation. If a patient's on a beta blocker, continue beta blockers in patients who are already receiving them. And that's a ton of patients. One of the wide, most widely prescribed class of drugs in the world. Patients taken for a lot of reasons, cardiac and otherwise. So that's it. Um, secondly, uh, uh, use beta blockers after surgery according to clinical circumstances, that really doesn't involve us. In patients with intermediate or high risk pre-op tests, it may be reasonable to begin a beta blocker. So if they had a stress test, cardiac stress test, EKG, some kind of pre-op workup, they have significant cardiac disease, maybe the cardiologist would be beneficial to put them on a beta blocker. In patients with greater than three cardiac risk index, it may be reasonable to start them prior to surgery. You notice they're very cautious nowadays because they don't know if the data is any good or not. They may be reasonable. Uh, initiating beta blockers in the peri-up setting to reduce risk is an uncertain benefit. And what they found is this. If you go in a pre-op and you see a patient and say, oh, they should be on a beta blocker, you give some IV, that increases their risk. If you're going to put them on a beta blocker, you need to do it before surgery, like at least a week before surgery. Beta blocker therapy should not be started on the day of surgery. So, if somebody's on it, keep them on it, but don't start them on it. Basically, that's the current wisdom. If they're on it, make sure they get their dose in the morning or you supplement an IV, whatever. We'll talk about giving it. But if they're not on them, don't start it the day of surgery. And that's it. So, the current, I'll put it here, current guidelines suggest that beta blockade may be reasonable in patients with myocardial ischemia. In that, uh, in, when they've been tested, if they are to be used as recommended, they begin at least one day or more before surgery. So don't start on the day of surgery. In fact, you're better off if you do it about a week before. In hospital, short-acting oral or IV beta blockers should be used to permit titration according to hemodynamics. No specific blood pressure or heart rate targets have been validated although 
get the blood pressure below 140 over 90, and the heart rate between 60 and 80, and you'll have a happy patient. So that'll be it. So those are the five classes of drugs for, for hypertension. And I'll summarize by saying this, because I'll ask you this on the next test. So make sure, I just want to be clear that I said it all out. How do these drugs work? If I ask you, how does a diuretic make blood pressure go down? The answer is most likely vasodilation by affecting potassium channels in blood vessels. Number two, how do calcium channel blockers make the blood pressure go down? The answer is cardiac depression, vasodilation. Number three, how do the ACE inhibitors make the blood pressure go down? Well, they block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, therefore producing vasodilation and blood pressure goes down. How do the ARBs make your blood pressure go down? They do it by blocking the angiotensin receptor. And so they're called angiotensin receptor blockers. How do beta blockers make your blood pressure go down? Cardiac depression, central vasomotor depression, and blocking renin release in the kidneys. There's three mechanisms. So that's how the five major antihypertensive drug groups uh, work. Now, I want to just mention a couple others. And so, well, I'll show you what I printed off here. I'll put it back on the screen. Alpha blockers. There are a group of drugs, alpha blockers, that are available to use as uh, antihypertensive. If you go to page 221 in the handout table, page 221, you'll see they list them there. Doxazazine is trade name is Carduro. Prazazine is mini press. And Terazazine is generic now. So there are some alpha blockers. How would alpha blocker make your blood pressure go down? This one's a, a no-brainer. Vasodilation, right? If the alpha receptors vasoconstrict, the alpha blockers vasodilate. Um, the problem is they get a lot of side effects from alpha blockers. Main one, of course, tachycardia because of the alpha blockade vasodilation. You get compensatory tachycardia, that's a problem. And the biggest problem is orthostatic hypotension, postural hypotension. The patient gets up in the morning, they get dizzy, and they change their position. You know, they're laying down, they sit up on the edge of the bed, they get dizzy, they fall over and bump their head, and then they sue you. So it has a lot of side effects from that. The only time they really are using it nowadays as a blood pressure drug is for people my age, men, who have prostatitis, and they have uh, enlarged prostates. So take a look at what Dr. Farnwall says. Alpha blockers, mechanism of action. Here, I'll go on the camera. By blocking the interactive norepinephrine with alpha receptors, drugs cause peripheral dilation, therefore lowering blood pressure. By increasing blood flow in skeletal muscles, they increase insulin sensitivity. They improve symptoms of prostatism, and all these drugs are generally block it. So they're, they're able to drop your blood pressure, but they're not effective for long-term use, usually because of a lot of side effects. Unless you have a big prostate, then you can be put on and hopefully it cures both problems at once if you get lucky. Blood pressure goes down and your prostate shrinks. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Okay, and then I want to look at the bottom of page 221 
We'll talk about direct vasodilators, and we're going to get into that starting right now. All right, there are three or four drugs that are called direct vasodilators. In pharmacology, what that means is this. They work directly in the blood vessel wall. They call them direct vasodilators because they work on the blood vessel wall directly. There's four drugs, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, hydralazine, and minoxidil, which nobody uses anymore, except for Rogaine to try to grow hair in your head. Peach fuzz. But at least three of them are still fairly widely used, and I say fairly. Uh, and that is nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, and hydrolysine. Now, let's start with the nitroglycerin and nitroprusside. They're both vasodilating because they have a nitro group in it. That's not, that's not a real mystery, right? Nitro, nitric oxide, nitric oxide, is the body's own chemical that causes vasodilation. So all blood vessels respond to the release of nitric oxide by vasodilating. That's the body's own vasodilating chemical. So nitroprusside and nitroglycerin both have nitro groups in them, molecule, hence the name. And these nitro groups go to the blood vessel wall and vasodilate because nitric oxide is a vasodilator in blood vessels. So that's simple. Nitroglycerin and nitroprusside work that way. Hydrolyzine, on the other hand, the third one, works by affecting potassium channels in the blood vessel. The open vascular potassium channels and that vasodilates. So hydrolyzine works on potassium channels, makes them open. That causes vasodilation. The nitroprusside and nitroglycerin work by contributing a nitro group to the blood vessel wall. Does that make sense? Now, go to page 250. 250. You're going to memorize this. It's easy. It'll make it in your career much happier. Your test grade, too. Here's the way it works. For vasodilating drugs, here's the scoop. Hydrolyzine dilates primary, primarily arteries. I'm on page 250. So arterial dilation, that's hydrolysis. A little bit of venous, but it's primarily a arterial dilator. Therefore, the books say hydrolysine's primary effect is to reduce afterload. Right? Arteries are afterload. Nitroglycerin, on the other hand, which we'll talk about extensively today, next class maybe, works primarily by dilating veins. It's primarily a venous dilator. A little bit of arterial, but mostly venous. All right, all other vasodilating drugs affect both arterial and venous equally. So when you hear that something's a vasodilator, what could that be? How about an inhalation anesthetic, ACE inhibitor, ARB, alpha receptor blocker, calcium channel blocker. All these vasodilating drugs will all dilate arteries and veins, except two. Hydrolyzine is mostly arteries. Nitroglycerin is mostly veins. All the rest are both, arteries and veins. All right, is everybody with me on that? And that's the way to remember it. Those are the two exceptions. All the rest are the same. For example, if you ask the average person, I would say even the average medical person doesn't have much cardiac background, how does nitroglycerin work? Most people will tell you, 
Well, it dilates the vessels in the heart and makes ischemia go the way. That's not true. Mostly how nitroglycerin works is it dilates your veins in your legs and blood pools in your legs. Your preload goes down. The work of the heart goes down with the reduction in preload and the angina goes away. If you look, talk to someone who takes nitroglycerin for angina attacks, they sit in a chair with their legs lower than the heart. That's the best way to get it to work. The worst thing you can do to somebody having an angina attack or an MI is have them lay down and put their legs up. Because you're putting all that blood, pouring it back into the heart, right? making the heart work harder. Right? So you take your nitroglycerin pill, sitting down with your legs lower than your heart, blood pools in your legs, cardiac work goes down. So nitroglycerin works by primarily by working on cardiac demand, making it lower. Not increasing supply, which most people think it does. It does a little bit. So anyways, without getting too nuts, my bottom line is this. Hydrolyzine is primarily a arterial dilator. Nitroglycerin is primarily a venous dilator. And any other vasodilator you can think of are going to do pretty much both arteries and veins the same, equally. That's calcium blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, alpha blockers, whatever else, like the gas anesthetics. They'll all do the vasodilating equally. Okay? So there we go. Now, if you want to take a look at page 222, page 222, and they list some of the combination products. I'm just showing this. I don't care if you ever learn this, but we'll just look at it. And what they're showing here is all the different combination products the companies have come up with. They got ACE inhibitors and diuretics all in the same pill. A combination product is you take two drugs and put them in the same pill combine the products to make it easier for the patients to take. Now they only have to take one pill and they get an ACE inhibitor and a diuretic together. So look at that, ACE inhibitors and diuretics, ACE, ARBs and diuretics, uh, direct renin inhibitor and diuretics, beta blockers and diuretics, they have to combine them all. So you can find a pill which combines pretty much any combination you want within reason and hopefully making the patient's compliance a little bit better. Okay, so I think that's kind of where we went last week. Um, and so I'd like to kind of pick up from there. And I'm already break time, so let's take a break and we'll pick it up when I get back. Okay, back to hypertension. So, to finish up on the beta blockers, I want to start on page 244. So, let's talk about this for a minute, the different classes of them. And uh, page 244. There we go. talk about beta blockers for a minute and don't write. Here's the problem. Uh, and and we, you already know this. Let me put it all together for you. Um, now beta receptors are defined, of course, as beta 1 being in the heart and beta 1 causes run and release in the kidneys and all the rest are beta 2 no matter where they are. Well, the beta blockers block both beta 1 and beta 2. So if you're giving a beta blocker for heart disease, which most of the time you are, then 
You don't, you want it to block beta 1, because that's the heart. It'll produce a nice effect. You want it to leave the beta 2 receptors alone, because blocking beta 2 receptors just gets you bad results. Bronchoconstriction, so you can't give it to asthmatics and COPD. You get vasoconstriction, but remember beta causes vasodilation, so beta blockers cause vasoconstriction. So they're always going to be, they say they're contraindicated in patients with peripheral vascular disease, claudication, etc., because it can make it worse. And then one we've already talked about, of course, the third, is if you block beta receptors, you block um, uh, glucose levels, uh, you cause hypoglycemia, because beta receptors produce glucose increases. Therefore, it's Careful, you have to be careful getting them di diabetics. So beta blockers are always a problem in diabetes, asthma, and COPD, and in peripheral vascular disease. It's not really an anesthetic issue, but it is if you're prescribing them for somebody with outside the OR. So what they did is they went back to the drawing board, the medicinal chemists, back in the 70s and 80s, and they tried to come up with what I refer to as selective drugs that would block beta-1 without blocking beta-2. If you can get beta-1 selective and just block beta-1, you have less side effects if you leave the beta-2 receptors alone. All right, it makes sense. So they tried and they tried and it didn't work. And they came up with something they refer to as cardioselective meaning beta-1 selective, same thing. But it's kind of a lie because they're only beta-1 selective in a laboratory at very low doses, etc. If you give higher doses or give them IV in doses that we use, then you pretty much lose any selectivity. So that's an issue. So they went back and tried some other things as well. And this is a little series of... Uh, of uh, drawings that start on page uh, 244 kind of uh, points that out. So let me go on the camera and point while I do this. So there's just pointing out, of course, that the beta receptor subtypes, beta 1 causes cardiac stimulation, renin release, and the burning of fat and lipolysis, and beta 2 does all the other good things. Bronchodilation, vasodilation, glycogenolysis, meaning your blood sugar goes up. So if you give a beta blocker, non-selective, page 245, the next page, what they're trying to show is if you block both beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, you get the effect you want in beta-1, which is slowing heart rate, renin suppression, so your blood pressure goes down, and less burning of fat, fatty acids. But you also get undesirable beta-2 effects. Bronchospasm, vasoconstriction, reduced energy, lower blood sugars, etc. So if you can get a cardioselective one, so this is over here, the cardioselective, beta-1 selective, then supposedly what you get is this. You still get the desirable effects, bradycardia, renin suppression, reduce fatty acids, but you won't get the undesirable beta-2. So cardioselective or beta-1 selective blockers are the, the holy grail, the desirable thing in pharmacology. Unfortunately, we only kind of have that. So what happened is they decided to come up with a new strategy and go to page 247 they came up with what they call ISA activity. So they have beta blockers that are beta blockers with ISA activity. The ISA means intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, ISA. What it is, is a beta blocker that doesn't block as strongly. It's a full out antagonist beta blocker. They only have partial efficacy. So what happens is, 
If a beta blocker has ISA, you'll still get bradycardia, but it won't be as much because it's not as strong. Less bronchospasm, less change in fatty acids, etc. So you get some beta blockade, but it's not as strong as usual beta blockade. So you don't get as significant a number of side effects. So they're just weaker beta blockers is what they are. This ISA means they say they have some intrinsic beta agonist activity, even though they're blockers. So compared to a full blocker, they're weak, so they don't totally block the beta receptor. They're drugs with ISA activity. Yeah, question? Why wouldn't you just use a lower dose of the other ones? Because uh, it's not, you're not getting the effect. Yeah, that's a good question. Why not use a lower dose? If you do, if you can, you do. But a lot of times the lower dose doesn't get you the effect you want. You gotta go higher to get the effect you want, therefore you end up with the side effects. Okay. So that's ISA activity. Now there's a second thing it's referred to as MSA activity. That's on page 248. That just means antiarrhythmic. So ones that are better antiarrhythmics, the beta blockers with better antiarrhythmic activity are the ones that are, they say they have MSA activity. Membrane stabilizing, MS. Membrane stabilizing activity. So they're better antiarrhythmics. All right, so let's go back to, where's my page? 220, back to page, page 220. And let's take a look at some. These are the beta blockers currently on the market, page 220. All right, note the first category are just the regular beta blockers. Drugs that you've seen a zillion times as, as nurses. Many patients take these. Atenolol, uh, metoprolol, oppressor, propranolol, rinderol, et cetera, et cetera. And see the second category, they say beta blockers with ISA activity. Intrinsic sympathomimetic activity. So these are beta blockers that don't have as many side effects as the other beta blockers. So if you have a patient who is asthmatic and you really want to put them on a beta blocker for some cardiac or other reason, then you want to use one of these with ISA activity. See what I'm saying? Now, the next one down from there said, well, we can get rid of one of the problems with beta blockers, and one of the main problems is they cause vasoconstriction. When you block beta receptors, you get vasoconstriction. And that's usually not desirable, especially in people with cardiac disease, because it increases the load on the heart, afterload and preload, and it can cause constriction, can raise your blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. You'd be better off to vasodilate. Well, they could do that by getting a beta blocker and changing the molecule to give it alpha blocking properties as well. So if you look at page 220 on the table, the second category, third category down, beta blockers with alpha blocking activity. So they came up with, well, you have two now on the market, very widely prescribed drugs, um, carvedilol or Coreg. It's probably the number one drug for heart failure now in America along with ACE inhibitor. And many cardiac patients take it. And it's a beta blocker with the alpha blocking properties. If you block alpha receptors, what do you get? Vasodilation. So you get rid of the vasodilating side effect of the beta blockers by making it an alpha blocker at the same time. See what I'm saying? So a beta blocker with alpha blocking properties gets rid of one of the three big side effects of the beta blockers because it causes vasodilation, unlike the usual beta blocker. You still have the other two big side effects, bronchial constriction and low blood sugar. But one out of three isn't bad. Now, of course, the other one is labetalol, which is used by anesthesia people a tremendous amount. We're going to talk about it in detail. And labetalol is famous for being, of course, a beta blocker 
that has alpha blocking properties as well. Play with the molecule, they know how to mess with it and make sure it's an alpha blocker as well. So labetalol makes your blood pressure go down and it vasodilates. That's good. We like vasodilation. So that's a good drug we'll talk about in a minute. Then finally, on the bottom, see they came up with a beta blocker that has nitric oxide activity. Why? Well, nitric oxide is the body's natural vasodilator, so this drug would be a vasodilator as well. So another way to get the drug to prevent it from vasoconstricting is to um, give it nitric oxide mediated activity. And that's nebivolol or bistolic, and that's the only one that nitric oxide activity. So that's the subcategories of beta blockers. Let me go through it one last time. There are non-selective beta blockers. They just block beta receptors, beta 1 and beta 2. And that's the granddaddy or the standard drugs. We all have seen them. There's a subcategory of beta blockers with ISA activity, which are trying to get them to have less side effects. And the ones with ISA activity will be safer in COPD, diabetes, and peripheral vasculitis. Third category down, there's beta blockers with alpha blocking activity, and that means they vasodilate. And then lastly, there's beta blockers with nitric oxide activity, that also means they vasodilate. So those are the subcategories of the different beta blockers. Okay, is everybody with me so far? Good. Now, let's go to page marked. Let's go to page 215. Page 215. All right, as always, yeah, question. Where do the MSA ones uh, fall on? MSA, they didn't have as a separate category. But that's usually just indirect, propanol is MSA. So if you're going to use it as an antiarrhythmic, that's probably a drug of choice. That's listed under non-selective. Yes? Can you say that the beta blockers and alpha blocking activity gets rid of the vasodilation or causes No, causes vasodilation. Yeah. If I said it, I said it wrong. They produce vasodilation. All right, so let's stop. Put every pens down, let me talk about anesthesia. This is the ultimate we're trying to get to, anesthesia, right? So, as I said before, we used to think hypertension was a risk factor for surgery. It's a very minor risk factor. After all the studies and many tens of thousands of patients, literally hundreds of thousands of patients that have been studied, it's noted that if we control the patient's pressure, then we usually don't have an issue. And so if a patient comes to us preoperatively and the pressure is high, anything other than a routine the finger case or something so small you wouldn't even want to do it, then you can just give IV drugs that we give and make the pressure go down. Our issue is usually in packing. So you can get somebody's pressure down during induction. You already know that. Whoops. You can get somebody's pressure down during the case. That's easy. Give more fentanyl. Turn it up to get SIVO. Give some IV something. Whatever. Where we have problem controlling pressure is in recovery room. Once you wake the patient up, you don't have our drugs in there anymore. They're coughing on the tube. They may be cold and they're shivering. They may be in pain because the surgeon cut them. So they got all those issues causing their pressure to shoot up. So our issue is always at the end of the case. How do we keep the patient from ending up in recovery room with a BP of 150, I mean a 250 over 150? How can we make sure the blood pressure stays stable? Well, here's a list of drugs that are kind of available to us that are used in the treatment of hypertensive emergencies, they say, but these are pretty much interoperative. And you see they list labetalol, of course, micardipine or cardine, uh, nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, esmolol, and 
Lastly, phentolamine, which I don't think anybody uses, but they put it on the table anyway. You ever use phentolamine for anything? Use it for a feel uh, Just for feel? Yeah. So anyways, there's the, the kind of the IV drugs that we have available to for us. So here's what happens. You had a patient with a high blood pressure. You were chasing the blood pressure pre-op, intra-op. You had to give them lots of drugs to keep their pressure down. So you kind of know at the end it's going to shoot up after you wake the patient up. So you want to start backing down on the gas, giving less fendo, and maybe you're using an opiate sparing technique. That's the new trendy thing. And whatever you're doing, you know the pressure is going to shoot up at the end. So you turn the gas, sevo down some, and you titrate in a little something. Well, the best choice for us is to titrate labetalol. So let's stop and talk about that for a minute. I assume you've all used it. It's a really good drug. It's very easily titrated. Its onset of action is very rapid. And so what you can do is turn the SIBO down half percent less, give them five milligrams of labetalol. Turn the SIBO down some, give them five, you know, in other words, have a little finesse to it, you know, don't just slam everything off and give drugs, I think, whatever, just be neat, be calm, take a few minutes. And uh, labetalol works nicely because it's, of course, a beta blocker and it's a vasodilator. So you, how's labetalol going to make your pressure go down? Direct cardiac depression, blocking renal release from the kidneys, CNS depression, and then, in addition, vasodilation. So labetalol is a good drug. You can titrate it five milligrams at a time until you get the pressure down to where you want it, and then get the patient off and recover. So it's a very useful drug. They say the onset of action is five, five to ten minutes, half-life is three to six hours. The dose is a quarter to a half milligram per kilo, and that's all fine. That's outside the operating room. In the OR, you give it at five milligrams at a time. You can wait two minutes, you see it work right away, it's very fast onset. If the pressure doesn't, or heart rate doesn't go down as much as you want, give another five milligrams. In other words, just keep titrating until you get the effect you want. And uh, it'll be a pretty good drug to use. Now, the question always comes up, what about Esmolol? Esmolol is a beta blocker, and of course it's short acting, so it's good for that whoops factor. I gave a beta blocker and the whoops. Pressure went down too much. Oh, but that's okay because it says well, it's going to wear off in three minutes. So uh, it's kind of nice for that. The downside is it says well, and it's going to wear off in three minutes. So if you get the patient where you want, then you got to do something more long term. But nonetheless, there are people that say, well, why don't you use Esmolol? What's preferable about Ibetalol? Well, what's preferable is Esmolol is a vasoconstrictor. It's like a regular beta blocker is a vasoconstrictor. It's a regular beta blocker. Labetalol is a vasodilator. You'd much rather dilate somebody if you're trying to lower their pressure than constrict them. They both work. I, Esmolol is not wrong. If you told me I gave Esmolol to make the pressure go down, I'd say, oh, how'd it work? Fine. So it's not wrong to do, but if what's better, better would be to use labella. It has a longer duration of action, you can titrate it to effect, and it vasodilates. Now, Esmolol is listed by the company as being cardioselective. And in fact, it is cardioselective in rats on Tuesday afternoons in very low doses. <laughs> In human beings and the doses that we give, it's not. I consulted on a case once years ago of a patient that had an intractable bronchospasm and actually rested on the table who was given Esmolol for hypertension during the case and he was an asthmatic and they had the patient had a bronchospasm from the Esmolol and, and arrested. They got her back and she did okay eventually, but it was not a pretty thing. And the uh, argument the person said was, 
Well, it's cardioselective. That's why I thought you could give it to somebody who's asthmatic. Well, it's cardioselective, that's, but that's a marketing term. That's not a real pharmacology term, because in the real doses, it's both beta-1 and beta-2. So, if somebody's asthmatic, don't give beta blockers. That's the idea. You know, they're, whether they're cardioselective or not, or alpha block, you know, if they're asthmatics, you don't give beta blockers. But, if you have to pick one, usually about all, it's much more titratable, and the duration, if you give up to a decent dose, you'll get a, a couple hours out of it. That's usually enough to get you settled in the recovery room and then get the patient back on medicines if they're on them or whatever to get it ready for the long term. So you can give Esmolol or Labetalol. They're both given in this syringe and uh, they're easily titratable, both of them are. Uh, Esmolol you can give a drip to. But uh, uh, Labetalol to me is a better choice. All right, anybody have any questions about that? Now, let's talk about uh, nipride and nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin we'll talk about uh, after next week's break when we do angina, so we'll get to that later. Let's talk about nipride. So, nipride is a, a niche drug, of course, that's used to drop people's blood pressure. It's a pure, direct vasodilator. In the pharmacology, when I say direct vasodilator, that means it mechanism is it goes to the blood vessel wall and produces dilation. In this case, it does it by releasing nitric oxide, hence the name nitroprusside, because it has a nitro group in it. So nitroprusside is used uh, when somebody has untoward hypertension, or you want to vasodilate them, you want to get their pressure down, you want to do any those kind of things. I'm going to make a wild guess. Any critical care nurse has probably used it, uh, uh, nipride. Um, but let me quit talking and let's go to the page 213. Page 213. And so here's the story. Nipride works by, as I said, uh, be the, for the fact that it has a nitro group in it. So nitroprusside is made up of the molecules, that's SNP here in the little drawing, page 1, 213. This SNP means sodium nitroprusside. So SNP, the molecule, is made up of five cyanides, CN, CN, see the air? CN, 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 CN. Five cyanide molecules surrounding one nitric oxide molecule. So it's an NL in the middle and five cyanides around the outside. That's what nitroprusside looks like. So each molecule of nipride, the drug, contains a nitro group, which causes a vasodilation, and five cyanides. Now, cyanide, of course, is poison, toxic. If you exceed the level of cyanide the body can handle, the patient gets cyanide poisoning. So let's talk about this a little bit. This is a pathway for metabolism of nipride. So what they're showing is this. When you give nipride to somebody, it's metabolized in the plasma by hemoglobin. So how, the, answer, the question is, how is nipride metabolized in the body? The answer is hemoglobin. What happens is this. Nipride, when you give it IV, attaches to a hemoglobin molecule and steals an electron from the hemoglobin, reduces it, so it goes from oxyhemoglobin to methemoglobin, reduced. And the extra electron from hemoglobin causes the molecule to be unstable and it just breaks open. So how does nipride, first, the first situation is, how does nipride get metabolized? The answer is hemoglobin. It steals an electron from hemoglobin, reduces the hemoglobin from oxyhemoglobin to methemoglobin, plus three, plus two, etc. 
and takes that extra electron, which makes the molecule of nitrite unstable and causes it to break open, metabolize. So that's issue number one. When the nitrite molecule metabolizes, it releases five cyanides. For each nitrite molecule you metabolize, you release five cyanide ions in the blood. And that's what they're showing here. Here's five cyanides. Now, some of the cyanide can attach to hemoglobin, form cyanomet hemoglobin, that's here, and it's no big deal. It sits on the hemoglobin, and eventually it'll release off the hemoglobin, get metabolized, and be eliminated. So that's not anything that matters. It's kind of like a holding pattern. You can attach to a hemoglobin one of the cyanides and sit there until it's ready to be eliminated. The other ones go into what is called the cyanide pool. In other words, they're just free cyanide in the blood. Now what happens is this cyanide in the blood gets detoxified in the body by this mechanism. The uh, cyanide attaches to uh, thiosulfate in the liver. The liver has thiosulfate in there. That's vitamin B12, by the way. And the enzyme involved is called rhodinase enzyme. Here it is here in this little purple dot. That's supposed to be your liver. See the enzyme rhodinase. The rhodinase enzyme is the enzyme group that causes cyanide to interact with vitamin B12, thiosulfate, and forms then thiocyanate. Thiocyanate then is peed out of your kidneys and you live happily ever after. So that's how the body detoxifies cyanide. I'll say it again. Free cyanide ion in the blood, it reacts, it's taken to the liver, reacts with thiosulfate, which is vitamin B12. The enzyme that catalyzes it is called rhodinase. The thiosulfate and cyanide combine to form thiocyanate. The thiocyanate is eliminated in the kidneys and everything's happily ever after. That's how you detoxify cyanide in the body. Now, the problem is this. The problem arises if you make so much cyanide and the cyanide pool gets so big, the levels go so high, that you exceed the body's ability to scavenge it. In other words, you have so much cyanide, you run out of vitamin B12 to get rid of it. You exceed the body's capacity to detoxify it. Then what happens is, this free cyanide here, this is what they're showing, goes in the cells and combines with cytochrome oxidase enzymes in the cell. Uh-oh, that's going to be trouble. Cytochrome oxidase, what does it do? Remember that from high school biology? Cytochrome oxidase is the enzyme that causes you to burn oxygen in the cell. That's the most, one of the most vital enzyme systems for life. When you breathe oxygen in, when it gets at the cellular level, molecular level, it's inside the cell, oxygen gets burned because of an enzyme group called cytochrome oxidase. To use lay terms. If you block cytochrome oxidase, you can't use oxygen in the cells. In other words, you get hypoxic. If you can't burn oxygen, that's called hypoxia, right? And therefore, if you get cytochrome oxidase gets blocked or poisoned, then the patient gets hypoxia. However, it's a different kind of hypoxia. It's called histotoxic hypoxia, histotoxic, meaning 
the patient's getting enough oxygen, in other words, they could be breathing 100% oxygen, so they're not hypoxic because they're not getting oxygen, their heart's beating, it's moving the oxygen around the body, that's not the problem. They got hemoglobin to carry the oxygen, that's not a problem. The problem is once the oxygen gets to the tissues and gets in the cell, the cell can't use it. The cell's ability to burn oxygen is blocked by the cyanide blocking cytochrome oxidase enzymes. That's how it produces toxicity. Alright, everybody with me? So what happens to the patient? You see this happening, oh an industrial accident, cyanide poisoning, cyanide gas in some industrial plant, people get exposed, they have high levels of cyanide in the body, they rush into the emergency room to try to help them out, and they die of hypoxia. But here's what happens. The patients turn pink. Because the oxygen can't be used in the tissues, then the oxygen in the arterial blood goes to the tissues and gets dumped off just like it's supposed to, but it never gets used. Therefore, it gets dumped into the venous blood. So your venous PO2 starts to rise. Your venous blood looks like, like arterial blood. It's nice and pink. So the patient's more and more hypoxic, and they turn more and more pink. They look like they're more and more oxygenated all the time. And that's because their cells aren't using the oxygen, so their venous blood just turns into well-oxygenated venous blood. In other words, the AVO2 difference goes down. So here's a patient dying of hypoxia, and if you do blood gases on them, do an arterial gas and a venous gas, their venous PO2 is going to be sky high. They're not looking like the usual hypoxic patient on blood gases, but they're as hypoxic as you can get. They don't turn cyanotic, they're pink. So the signs of cyanide poisoning is you do blood gases and their AVO2 difference goes down, the venous PO2 is high, but they get acidotic because they're hypoxic. They produce lactate, and lactate makes you acidotic. So their bicarb goes down, their pH is acidotic, all the signs of hypoxia except their PO2 is high. Venus and arterial. You see the difference? And the patient dies of hypoxia. Now, with with nitride, and we have it, have it in here, in uh, page 213. So if you go to page 214, We'll see here. Uh, this is the company, Roche Labs, page 214. Their recommendations for the administration of nitride. Initial infusion rate should be 0.3 to 0.5 mics per kilo per minute. If needed, increase it no higher than 2 mics per kilo per minute. The maximum rate is 10. That's really high. I don't think anybody would ever do that. They say consider alternate or additional drugs to reduce or shorten infusions. So in other words, don't just use nitride to take the pressure from 140 down to 90. Turn them on 3% SIVO, that'll get them down to 100, then bring them the rest of the way with nitride. In other words, use more than one drug, so you're not going to get lots of nitride. Try to keep minimizing it. Use additional drugs if possible. If they are starting to show signs of cyanide poisoning, again, I'm on page 214, uh, CMS dysfunction, mental changes, seizures, coma, tach tachycardia, all the classic signs of hypoxia, arrhythmias, etc., etc. So what do you do to treat it? What, what causes the cytochrome oxidase to be blocked exactly? The cyanide uh, binds, the negative charge in cyanide binds to the uh, 
uh, electron transport positive charges in cytochrome oxidase, therefore it can't, uh, it uses oxygen by jumping electrons. And the cyanide being very electronegative blocks that from happening. So just an excess of cyanide? Yes, the cyanide combines to the uh, cytochrome oxidase and makes it not useful. Okay? Now, treatment. How do you treat cyanide toxicity? Every hospital in America has a cyanide toxicity kit in the pharmacy that's mandated by the Joint Commission. Every pharmacy in a hospital pharmacy in America has the drugs and it all in a nice little kit and they're ready for the pharmacist to rush it up to you if you need it for whatever reason and so this is what you do. Treatment of suspected cyanide poisoning. You call the pharmacy, I have a suspected cyanide toxicity, I need to treat it, they'll send you up this little kit. All right. Now, you can measure uh, you usually don't measure cyanide in the blood directly. It can be done, but cyanide is pretty volatile. It's hard to measure as a blood test. So what you, they tend to do is measure thiocyanate levels. Thiocyanate is the non-toxic byproduct of metabolism. But when that level is high, then it means the cyanide is high. So they usually measure it indirectly by measuring thiocyanate. Nonetheless, if they do have an excess of cyanide in the blood and they need to be treated, this is the recommendation. This is Pharmacology 101. Stop the infusion of nipride, duh. Number two, 100% oxygen, even though they're probably getting enough oxygen, it never hurts to give them 100%. Uh, three, mechanical ventilation is needed. So if the patient is not breathing right or if they were in a, a fire and they got some smoke inhalation and some cyanide from that, uh, fire byproducts, etc. So, you know, just maintain the airway, you know how to do that. Uh, correct the acidosis if they're acidotic by giving bicarb. And then give 3% sodium nitrate, 4 to 6 milligrams slowly IV, followed by Thiosulfate, 150 to 200 milligrams per kilo IV over 15 minutes. And you can consider putting some yellow vitamin B12 in their IV to give them continuous thiosulfate. That's the standard treatment with your knee hair doc. Somebody came in with cyanide poisoning through an industrial accident, whether you're an ICU nurse or an IOR nurse. Now, we're the least likely to see this, let's face it. If somebody comes to surgery with a nipride drip going, chances are we'll knock the pressure down with our drugs and just turn it off. Or at least just leave it going very little. If for whatever reason you're going to use it interoperatively, they haven't been on it before, the chances of you making them cyanide toxic is almost nil. We're not going to, just not going to give that much. But if somebody's been on it a couple of days in ICU, and then they come to surgery for whatever reason, They've been getting prolonged infusions, then maybe, you know, you've got to kind of keep an eye. But still, it's pretty rare. But nonetheless, that's it. So, let me summarize again. Nitride is, as a drug, is made up of a molecule of nitric oxide, NO. That produces the vasodilation of that you want. And five cyanides for each molecule of nitride. The cyanides are detoxified in the body, in the liver, the enzyme system is rhodinase. They're detoxified by combining it with thiosulfate to produce thiocyanate. The cyanide is then eliminated in the kidneys. If there's too much cyanide, you can't detoxify it fast enough. The excess cyanide goes into the cells, binds with cytochrome oxidase, produces toxicity. What happens is the patient gets hypoxic, histotoxic hypoxia. And they'll die of the hypoxia. Uh, the treatment is, of course, listed here again. Stop the infusion. You can give sodium nitrite, which causes methemoglobinemia. That binds some of the cyanide. But you can skip that step and just go right to the thiosulfate. Um, 
two blood gases, check there for acidosis. And there you go. So that's an eye brush. Yes, question? I would be nervous, yes. <laughs> if somebody was in liver failure, I think an eye is probably not the drug to give them. So that's, good. that's a good point. Also, renal failure? I would say renal failure too because that eliminates the thiocyanate. So yeah, I'd be careful about those. There's other vasodilators you can use. So. Now lastly, on the bottom of this, and then we'll take a break, I promise. You notice I typed in here, page 214. Renin release is the cause of rebound hypertension following the uh, cessation of nitride. I just put that there because I'm a certifying exam. I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but giving questions away. But there's a question on the certifying exam that says this. Uh, it's common to get rebound hypertension after you turn the nitride off, especially in somebody who's been on for a couple days. You know, if you've only been on for 20 minutes, it's not going to happen. But if somebody's been on for a prolonged period of time, then you turn the nap right off, they can get a, a rebound hypertension. And it's caused because of a rebound in renin release in the kidneys. There you go. See, the CERT exam, the pharmacology is the easy part, to me, anyways. <laughs> well, I mean, to you, to me. I didn't mean it that way. I meant it too, it should be to you, too. What are they going to ask you about propofol after you've given it 500 times? That, you know, gee, the blood pressure goes down when you give propofol? Who knew? <laughs> so, I mean, the pharmacology is the easy part of the exam test. Learn those tracks. That's what you need to know. Uh, okay, let's take a break. So back to page 215. 215. We talked about labetalol. The characteristics, which I'll repeat again, is that it's a beta blocker with alpha blocking properties. Therefore, it's a vasodilating beta blocker. And it's an excellent drug to treat hypertension. And many anesthesia folks, in fact, most, use it as the preferred drug. Um, Nitride nitroglycerin, we'll talk about after the break. I mean, next week's break. Um, as well. So let's compare the two. I'm going to ask you this on a test. A lot of people ask this. This is what it is. What's the difference between esmolol and labetalol? Those are the two drugs we give a lot in anesthesia. Because they're available IV. And they're titratable and they're good drugs. So what's the difference? Well, We'll start with ethanol. Ethanol is listed as being cardioselective. I'm telling you it isn't, but it's listed as being cardioselective. Number one, labetalol is not. Labetalol is an alpha blocker. Ethanol is not. Ethanol, if you recall from last semester, is broken down. In the reason it's so short acting is it's broken down very rapidly by nonspecific esterases in the plasma. And remember, I'll go off on a tangent here for a second, hydrolysis of estertite drugs occurs with two sets of potential catalyzing enzymes, colon esterase, and if it isn't colon esterase, then we say it's a nonspecific esterase. So esmolol falls in the nonspecific esterase category. It's metabolized by non-specific esterase enzymes in the plasma. Specifically, if you want to be more specific, RBC esterase. That's the non-specific esterase enzyme that metabolizes it. RBC esterase. So uh, esmol is short-acting because of its rapid hydrolysis in the plasma, catalyzed by non-specific esterase enzyme, RBC esterase. Esmolol is preferred, I would say, this is safe to say, to treat tachycardia, whereas labetalol is preferred to treat hypertension. They both will do both. They're not wrong. It's just if you're looking at which is better at which, labetalol is better at treating hypertension. 
as well as better at treating tachycardia. Now here's one. All they always ask you this on tests. I'll probably do the same thing. I, after all, I want to follow the crowd. <laughs> and I'll lose my card, a CRNA card. Here's the question. You have a patient in the operating room. You can make this long. You have a patient in the operating room. The blood pressure is one, pick a number, 170 over 110, and the heart rate's 125. Which drug would you like to give to treat this nasty situation? And the answer will be labetalol, of course, because the key thing is the heart rate. All right? They're saying the heart rate's fast. A beta block would treat both the blood pressure and the heart rate. All right, here's question number two. Same thing. You got a patient, you pack you, nurse calls you, blood pressure is 170 over 110, and the heart rate is 72. They're trying to compensate so they get a slower heart rate. What drug are you going to pick to treat that patient? Ooh, I don't know if I want to use labetalol, all, right? Make the heart rate go too slow. Hmm. Anybody want to pick one? Hydralazine, thank you, very good. Hydralazine would probably be your second choice. Now, you could give nipride, you could give nitroglycerin, but it's just it's silly. You're going to have to put an A line in, you're going to stick the poor packing nurse with a drip of nipride or something, just to get the pressure down a little bit. It's, you know, they're, they're, going, to, they're going to not want you in their room anymore. So you wouldn't do that. But the one that you can use is hydrolysine. Now, hydrolazine, of course, is given IV in small increments, and you can give it because it's a pure vasodilator. It's a direct vasodilator by definition, primarily arterial. It works by opening potassium channels and blood vessels. And you can treat hypertension and bradycardia because it's a pure vasodilator. It's not going to cause the heart rate to go down anymore. In fact, you may get some reflux tachycardia from it. So you give hydrolyzine. You can increment it in 10, 20 milligrams at a time. The key with hydrolyzine, anybody who's ever used any degree of it or any appreciable amount of it will tell you that the onset is slow. The onset can be up to 10 minutes. That's an eternity for us, as you know. You give labetalol, and I mean it's working in 60 seconds. You give esmolol, and you're starting to see some effect in 60 <coughs> seconds. You give hydrolyzine, and it doesn't seem to be working. So you give 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams. You wait five minutes. Oh, the pressure didn't go down enough. I'll give another 20. Oh, you wait five minutes. Oh, the pressure didn't go down. You get the point. And all of a sudden, the pressure goes from 170 to 70 because it all kicks in at the same time, and you get an overshoot. So my point is, give it a little time to work before you decide to inc you know, top up the dose a second time, and which you may have to a lot of times. As I said, the funny thing about hypertension, we talked about it last week, is that what one drug at one dose works very well. One patient doesn't touch the next patient because their reason for their hypertension may be totally different. Theirs is renal, not central, not cardiac, not you know, whatever. Hormone. So, uh, hydrolyzine is a choice if you have hypertension and slow heart rate. Labetalol is a choice if you have hypertension and a fast heart rate. And that's the kind of thing they want you to differentiate. And that, you know, if they try to sneak that by, now you, they're not going to be able to do that, right? Because you got it all. So, again, so, uh, to summarize. Labetalol is a beta blocker, it's also an alpha blocker, so the vasodilates. And esmolol is a beta blocker that does not vasodilate because it has no other properties. However, it's short acting because it's metabolized by RBC esterases in the plasma. And that's the difference between the two. Okay, any questions on any of that? Now, I want to also, the next thing then, is just very briefly uh, mention 
Um, if we go to, oops, sorry, page 221, page 221, the table, I want to mention, lastly, uh, there's some the centrally acting drugs. Oh, is that on the right page? Maybe not. And uh, what I'm getting at is I wanted to mention uh, clowning. So there's some centrally acting um, antihypertensive drugs that are used. Uh, minoxidil is one, but it's lousy. And another one is climbing. And here we go. Uh, page 221. Central acting drugs. Clonidine is an alpha-2 presynaptic central agonist. What other drug is in the same category? Presidex, right, exactly. Very good. So here's what you need to know about clonidine. Not much, but just know this. Its effect is it acts on presynaptic alpha-2 central receptors, therefore causing less catecholamine release, therefore acting as a sympatholytic and making your blood pressure go down. Now, clamidine is a drug of last resort. Because of its toxicity potential, it's not uh, the first drug you pull out of the arsenal to treat hypertension. So if you see a patient come to surgery and they're on clonidine, you know this. Number one, they're very hard to treat hypertensive because they tried one, two, three drugs, then they tried to up the doses of those drugs. None of that worked. They ended up going to clonidine. So anybody who's on it, you know right away they're, quote, pretty a bad hypertensive. Number two, it is the most potent drug to show withdrawal phenomena. In other words, the worst drug you can stop giving somebody is, is clonidine. It has the most potent withdrawal symptoms of any drug on the market. Any. So if somebody's on clonidine at home, you got to make sure they take it in the hospital. Otherwise, they're going to have withdrawal. The FDA, in fact, asked the company to come out with patches because so many grandma and grandpas were, you know, let their prescription run out, and the next day they find them, you know, in a ball on the floor having some cardiac event because they had a withdrawal hypertension. Their blood pressure went up to 300 or something. So the company made patches, and they're still, you know, a lot of people use the patches so that it doesn't wear off abruptly. If it does wear off, it wears off slowly. They don't get such a rebound. So, something, in other words, you have to make sure the patient either takes their clonidine in the morning of surgery, if it's an outpatient, most of our patients these days are, or that they have a patch on, or if they haven't had it, call the pharmacy and get a dose, give it to them before they go to sleep, so that blood pressure doesn't shoot up at the end, whatever. That's how it works, and that's what it's used for, only in the most severe cases. And you have to watch out. They don't stop taking it. Now, finally, we'll quit for the day because I'm getting tired of talking. <laughs> um, I want to talk about withdrawal or giving cardiac medicines. And we'll, we'll get through this again because we're going to do angina next, and that's an important with a lot of cardiac medicines involved. But here's the question. Somebody's on cardiac meds. They come to surgery. Should they take them or shouldn't they? Should you hold them prior to surgery or shouldn't you? And there's a controversy. Primarily the controversy exists with ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. So the angiotensin affecting drugs, the ACE inhibitors and ARBs. There is a, uh, a big controversy over whether the patient should take them prior to surgery. So the common wisdom is this. Um, you should take all your medicines prior to surgery. 
So tell the patients, and this is what they're instructed in the pre-op clinic, or if you see the patient preoperatively, God forbid, we don't do that too often anymore, except on a stretcher, you know, 10 minutes before they go to sleep. But if you see them in a pre-op clinic or whatever, um, we always instruct the patients to take all your medicines prior to surgery. The two exceptions is some people get a little nervous about diuretics. I'm talking about cardiac drugs. If somebody's on diuretics for hypertension, which lots of people are, they go, oh, well, maybe you should hold that dose of diuretic the morning surgery, and they're worried about what? <laughs> hypokalemia, right? They're worried that diuretic, diuretic's going to cause hypokalemia. Well, it's stupid. Give them their diuretic. If their potassium's low, put potassium in their IV. You ever done that before? That's real hard to do. <laughs> so, I mean, you know. Don't withdraw the drugs, they're going to end up hypertensive in recovery. The second issue is with the angiotensin effectors, the ACE inhibitors and the ARVs. And that's a very valid issue. All the studies have shown it started with heart patients. What was happening is people were going in for their heart surgery, they're all taking ACE inhibitors. I can trust you, anybody with cardiac disease these days, they're on ACE inhibitors. They go in there, they get an in, in, uh, induction, their blood pressure goes low during induction, you give them some vet pressors, uh, ephedrine, uh, phenylephrine, whatever else you want to empty the drawer up, and their pressure doesn't go up. And they eventually ended up having to be treated with vasopressin. And that's the only pressor that seems to work in these particular patients. And they coined the term uh, vasoplegia for the phenomenon of hypotension during induction in patients that are on ACE inhibitors or ARVs. They say they had vasoplegic effect, meaning they're vas vasodilated and they can't seem to treat it with the usual suspect drugs like ephedrine or phenylephrine or whatever. Love of that. So they recommended that if patients are in ACE inhibitors or ARBs, you stop them before surgery, the morning of surgery. Take them all the way up to the day before and just skip the morning dose. Their half-lives are fairly short for all those drugs, usually six to eight hours, something like that. So missing one dose will get their blood level down <coughs> and they'll have less vasoplegia. Well, then people started to look at non-cardiac surgery. Just what is, happens if a patient's on an ARB or ACE inhibitor and they're going for a knee operation or whatever operation. That's the usual scenario we see somebody who don't spend a lot of time in the heart room. So these patients also exhibited uh, some vasoplegia. Some patients do, some patients don't. Some patients responded to ephedrine, some didn't. And they end up getting vasopressin. So, it, nowadays, if you jump up to, to current, we've of course divided into two camps. Those that say you should withhold the ACE inhibitors and ARBs the morning of surgery and reinstitute them as soon as possible after the procedure. And those who say make sure they get them. I'd say right now, if I had to weigh the literature, that look at that needle, the needle's leaning a little bit towards the withhold group. However, as I said, Dr. Brunwald published this Bible of, of uh, uh, cardiac medicine two weeks ago, and I was noted to this. I'll put it in here, on the bottom here. Uh, oh, it's not on, sorry. There we go. All right, right here. Currently, debate surrounds the optimal decision on withholding ACE inhibitors and ARBs the day of surgery. Studies support both continuation and withholding. So both sides have got studies that they can point to. Although continuation may require treatment with vasopressin for intractable hypotension. It is important to restart these agents as soon as possible post-op. That's what Dr. Brunwald says about the controversy. Well, thanks for the help. <laughs> Start them up soon after post-op. Yeah, I can't figure that out. So he notes there's a controversy. 
and uh, you're going to run into people that are both. Um, I, I tend to be more and take the medicines. I'd rather have the patient maintain their medicines and then treat it from there. But uh, I, I'm not, you know, pounding that table over it. I certainly respect people who say what they want to withhold. It doesn't hurt to withhold one dose of an ACE inhibitor and then put a mind back on it after they leave recovery room. That's a perfectly logical thing to do. It tends to be easier for patients if they don't have confusion. Take the blue pill, don't take the yellow pill kind of instructions. So if most people have cardiac, severe cardiac disease, around six medicines, you want to take five, but don't take this one, then people get confused. So it's easier to say, take all your medicines. But then again, maybe it's not the best thing to say. So I just want you to be aware there is a controversy that's out there involving the uh, withholding of a morning dose of either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Some folks say yes, some folks say no. Um, if you do get vasoplegia and they can't, they drop their pressure during induction. Well, first of all, what I would do is give them less propofol to begin with. If you got somebody on an ACE inhibitor and they're coming to surgery or an ARB, and there's a lot of people, you're going to see that almost every day, then start with a little bit lower dose of propofol. You can always give more. And make sure the pressure doesn't go down too much, uh, especially in people that are a little bit debilitated, you know, some uh, multiple issues. Uh, but if not, uh, Try to treat it with the normal pressors. If you can't, you might have to go to a small dose of vasopressor. Um, okay. Uh, any questions on any of that? Okay, I'm tired. I quit. <laughs> I'll see you in two weeks. We'll pick it up from there.